So automation, automation, automation. Why is it so important? <laughs> Good questions. So um, automation has a lot of benefits. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, you cut down on uh, manual work mm -hmm. and this lets you focus on more interesting and important tasks, mm -hmm. such as uh, spending more time on uh, understanding the business problem sure. or uh, exploring data. Okay. Less manual work also means fewer mistakes. Ah, especially if I'm doing it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, once you've automated automated a workflow, it will run the same every, mm. every single time. Sure. Okay. Most importantly, automation standardize your workflows and make it easier to test, document, and share them. Mm. Okay. Automation also helps you to scale, especially when you use uh, on-demand infrastructure in the cloud. Automation and cloud infrastructure go and in end. Mm -hmm. There is an API for everything. And also you can schedule and fire up as many jobs as you need, as often as you need. Sure, makes sense. And uh, automation, the uh, finally the last benefit, one of the, the, the last benefit is the traceability. Trace Auditing and maintenance are improved thanks to the automation, as uh, runs and log can uh, easily be stored in a well-known place. Okay. So, as you can see, uh, automation has a lot of benefits, which uh, we would love to add to our uh, ML workflows for uh, data prep, of course, model training, model deployment, and so on. Yeah, automation is uh, is central to any kind of workload, and of course, it's. Uh, also beneficial for uh, machine learning projects, even at small scale. Mm -mm, uh, mm -hmm. People think usually, oh, you know, I'm doing small scale work or I'm, I'm just working in a small team. Why do I, do I really need automation? And I think, in fact, uh, small teams need uh, automation even more mm -mm. because they have, you know, fewer resources. They have no time to waste mm -hmm. on manual tasks. So let's zoom in on automation a little bit. So. In my experience, we really have two angles, right? Mm -hmm. We have the development angle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we have the operations angle. Yeah, that's completely right. So um, ML teams need uh, complete, complete freedom uh, in uh, experimenting, training and deploying. They should be as autonomous as possible in their development sandbox. And uh, in order to do so, they use uh, many different tools. Yeah, so if you're wearing the, let's say, the data science hat or the, you know, the machine learning engineering hat or generally the development hat, you, what you want to do is build workflows for data processing and model training, mm -hmm. model evaluation, uh, batch transform, uh, even local prediction in your in your account, and you can use different tools. So. You know, developers I, I, I meet use a mix of open source and mm. AWS tools. So for open source, popular options are MLflow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a project started by uh, by Databricks, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, Apache Airflow is very popular as well uh, for, uh, uh, you know, to orchestrate um, uh, machine learning workflows. And on the AWS side, um, we've, uh, we've had the, an SDK called the Step Function Data Science SDK. Mm -hmm. Um, um, which is kind of uh, improved on by uh, the SageMaker Pipelines SDK, which we'll uh, discuss today, a Python SDK to uh, make automation pretty simple. So these are just examples. There are many, many other tools uh, for development. And, and of course, they're all, they're all interesting and worth a look. So what about the operations angle? Yes, so um, operation teams are uh, responsible for uh, uptime, performance, scalability, and security of the uh, production platform. Mm -hmm. So this requires uh, implementing rock solid uh, processes that guarantee the quality of all artifacts uh, coming from the development teams, uh, from, the, from the development teams. So uh, QA, continuous integration, continuous development, and so on. Of course, uh, this process needs to be uh, automated too, although some manual approval steps mm. may be yes. necessary. Yes. For example, approving models before they are deployed. Mm -hmm. But uh, once again, I think there are, there are many different tools uh, to do that. Yeah, for right? 
to manage production and infrastructure, there are plenty of tools. So if I were the ops or ML ops or DevOps, whatever name you want to give it to the to you want to give to that, um, then my focus is you know building workflows to provision and manage and and scale uh, infrastructure, right? So um, uh, you know deploying models, updating models in production. Uh, scaling, uh, prediction infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so again, there's a mix of open source and AWS tools. So open source uh, tools include uh, Terraform, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a really nice uh, infrastructure as code uh, um, uh, open source project. And there's another one that I really like. It's called Troposphere. <laughs> so check it out. And Troposphere is uh, basically a Python uh, project that lets you code um, uh, your cloud formation templates, right? So you write code and then generate templates. And uh, I, I really like that way. Um, and of course you have AWS options. So cloud formation, uh, which we'll discuss today, infrastructure as code again, using uh, templates, uh, CDK, mm -hmm. which is uh, again, a programmatic way to uh, create templates using a, a collection of languages, uh, JavaScript and uh, Python and a few more. And there's the SageMaker Pipelines ML Ops uh, feature, kind of a long name, that helps you uh, define uh, deployment templates mm -hmm. uh, that integrate with the SageMaker uh, environment, right? So uh, we won't dive too deep on this one today, we'll, although we'll talk a little bit about cloud formation, okay? But we only have an hour, so we have to make choices. <laughs> so that's a lot of tools. Right, and I, again, there are many more. So, can we use only one? Is there <laughs> one tool I can use to do all of it? Are you being lazy now, Julian? Yes, <laughs> as always. <laughs> no, this is actually a good, a very good point, um, because data scientists usually work with one set of tools and uh, ops teams with another. Mm -hmm. This can make it unnecessarily uh, difficult to move model across pro environments. For example, from the uh, data science uh, sandbox to a production environment. Mm. And in fact, this is the reason why uh, customers ask us uh, to build SageMaker pipeline, because one set of tools that all team can collaborate with and uh, which is going to facilitate, facilitate and uh, speed up the ML workflows. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Trying to you know bring everything and everybody together and you know collaborating with tools that work together mm -hmm. is, is an interesting uh, uh, is an interesting aspect of SageMaker pipelines. So uh, let's uh, let's start looking at our pipelines. So what are the steps we're gonna we're gonna add to the pipeline? So we are going to use the pipelines uh, SDK to prepare a pipeline with the following steps. Okay. First, feature engineering. Mm -hmm. Second ingest the engineered uh, feature uh, in SageMaker feature store. Then build uh, the data set using an Atina query on the offline store. Okay. Then train, train with uh, blazing tests. Uh -huh. Then create the model uh, in SageMaker and uh, register the model in the SageMaker pipelines uh, model registry. And after, we will use uh, the SageMaker SDK and the cloud formation in order to deploy our models. Okay, so end to end, start from the data set, feature engineering, mm -hmm. ingest in feature store, build it, set, train, yeah. register, yeah. and deploy. Okay, so let's get Perfect. to work. <laughs> let's get to work. So time to uh, move to my screen and we can start looking. Uh, we have many notebooks for you today. I've been pretty busy. Uh, so lots of stuff to, to discuss. Uh, so this first notebook um, is um, basically um, defining the end-to-end -end pipeline we're going to run. Now, of course, uh, I didn't write this in one step. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the methodology that I used and I think it hopefully it can be useful to uh, to everybody out there is this. So of course, first I write a notebook where I, I try to solve the problem, and it's pretty much what we've done last mm -hmm. week, uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a notebook where you know I have all my steps in the same notebook, and you know I'm fighting to get to uh, a trained model, a model that I can predict with. So the first step is obviously 
get the model to work. And mm -hmm. then you can start automating, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would recommend automating each step individually with SageMaker processing, um, because it, it, as you will see, this gets you really close to building the pipeline, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's a good first step. Uh, so make it work in your in your notebook and then start breaking down into individual SageMaker processing jobs. Okay, I'll show you examples. Once you've done that, then you can take all those pieces and build your pipelines with the, the SageMaker Pipelines SDK, mm -hmm. right? And here I'm doing this in this notebook, which is probably a good step. But then, you know, eventually I want to completely automate this. You know, I don't want to run notebooks for production. So I would uh, um, move all that code maybe to a Python script uh, or a Lambda function mm -hmm. that is triggered or scheduled anytime I want the workflow to run. So these are the steps, right? So make it work, automate it piece by piece, take all the pieces and put them together in a pipeline, and then take that and run it automatically or on demand whenever you need to. Okay, so that's the way I did it. Uh, and um, it's, you know, I think it's pretty reasonable. So um, tell us a little bit about the pipeline concept. What are yeah. we really doing here? So yes, because I think it's important to uh, define first uh, what a pipeline is. Mm -hmm. So a SageMaker pipeline is a series of interconnected steps mm -hmm. that are uh, defined by a JSON pipeline definition using, and we will see that together, a, a directed acyclic graph. Sure. Acy acyclic graph, sorry. So. The structure and the dynamic of the pipeline is determined by, by uh, the data dependencies between steps. Mm -hmm. This is really the reason why we talk about interconnection. And these data dependencies are created when the properties of a step's outputs are passed as the input of uh, mm. to another step. Yeah, so automatically, exactly. right? automatically yeah. we, we assemble those steps. Okay. Exactly. So when you create a pipeline instance, you need to define a name, of course, for it. And after you need to define the step of this pipeline and the parameter attached uh, to these uh, steps. Okay, so let, let's let's look at how we do this. And uh, it, it's pretty intuitive, I think. Mm -mm -mm. Um, so of course, first I'm going to take the data set and copy it in S3, uh, very exactly the same thing as last week. And then uh, I can have some parameters mm -hmm. for uh, for my pipeline. So, um, you know, anything goes, but here uh, I, I've used parameters for the region mm -hmm. I'm running in, um, the number of instances that I want to use for SageMaker processing jobs, the instance type I want to use, same thing for the training instances, uh, the default model approval status, which is really important. We'll get back to that. So mm -hmm. for now, remember, we do not automatically approve models. We leave them in the, this state called pending manual approval. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a parameter for input data, which is really the S3 location for my data set. And I have another parameter for the model name that mm -hmm. I'm going to train. But you can you can use anything that you want. So. Piece by piece, right? Uh, we can, um, and maybe let me show you um, what the pipeline looks like. I think it makes it easier to understand. Okay, so yeah, this is what the pipeline is going to look like. Okay, so process data, uh, ingest data into feature store, query the feature store using Athena to uh, build a data set, then train, then create the model as a SageMaker model and register it in the model registry. Okay, so these are the steps we're working on. Okay, um, and of course, we'll uh, we'll get back to that. So let me close this. Okay, so def we need to define the steps one by one. So the first step is a pre-processing step. And you can see we actually use uh, the SageMaker processing object here. So this is why I told you, if you start by building a script with SageMaker processing, it's going to make your life much easier. And mm -hmm. this is really what I've done here. Um, and this is the same as last week, if you if you remember that, right? You can see sklearn processor, and then passing my actual processing script mm -hmm. with the input data, output data. Okay, so if you've already done that, and I've done the same for... Um, ingestion, 
And I've done the same for uh, querying the data and building the data set, right? So it makes, you know, it's divide and conquer, right? So mm -hmm. you break down the problem into smaller chunks, create all your SageMaker processing jobs, and that makes it easy to automate, okay? So the processing step um, is based on uh, an object called processing step in the, in the pipelines SDK. And I simply pass that processor object uh, and inputs and the name of the script and the arguments. And you can see this is almost exactly the same as this, right? Okay, so this is why I'm saying if you do this first, if you if you build all those individual processing jobs, it's super easy to automate, mm -hmm. right? Actually, the only difference is this thing is called arguments, and here it's called job arguments. <laughs> API consistency, please. <laughs> we need to fix this. So anyway, that's the processing step. Now, I do the same for the ingestion step, okay? Exactly the same thing. I actually use the same uh, SKLearn no. processor object, passing the input, and you can see this is what you just said. The input of this job, as you would expect, is the output of the processing job. And by doing this, right, by grabbing the uh, output location for the processing step and feeding this as an input for the um, ingestion step, we automatically define the structure of the pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. The dependency is already taken care of, okay? Mm -hmm. And this will output uh, the feature group name, okay? So it's just it just saves that uh, into a text file, why not? And again, we have the script and we have arguments, right? And this is really, if you watched uh, the last episode, this is really the code that we used last time around, uh, put into a SageMaker processing job, right? And then, okay, so then we build the data set, right? So this is where we run, uh, this, is, this is this code. Remember, we run an Athena query on the offline store to create mm -hmm. the data set. Okay, same code as two weeks ago. And again, uh, the input here is uh, the output it's of the previous step, right? So I'm reading the feature group name, because this gives me access to the Athena table that I'm going to query on. Okay, very nice, simple way to do this. And again, outputs and arguments. Okay, so these are the three um, processing steps, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, pre-processing the data, ingesting it in feature store, and querying it with Athena. Okay, so after this one, then I have uh, this is the output here. I have a training set and I have a validation set mm -hmm. in the blazing text format that we discussed two weeks ago. Okay, so now I can train, right? And I move on to the training step. And again, I can literally copy paste a lot, which I love because I'm lazy. <laughs> and I can exactly copy paste that uh, estimator from my previous notebook. Okay, set hyperparameters for blazing text. And this time I use a different object in the pipelines SDK, which is called training step. And I'm passing an estimator and I'm passing inputs. And you understood this thing now. The inputs are the outputs Put. from the uh, Athena it. job, it, yeah. right? So to speak. Okay. So you see the how you build that thing. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, dependencies are taken care of. So you just have to reference inputs and outputs and automatically you build this thing, okay? So once this completes, I will have a train model and I wanna do two things. First, I want to create the model in SageMaker. And I, you know, I always complain about the name because creating models is not training the model. We already did that. Creating the model is just um, making, defining it as a model in SageMaker that we can deploy. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's just, you know, listing this uh, artifact in S3 as, okay, this is something I can deploy, right? Uh, and yeah, I just pass the, the model data coming from the training step. And uh, I just create that create model step. Okay, this is a really simple one. And 
in parallel, I want to register a model. Mm -hmm. Okay, and registering a model, as we will see, creates a new entry in the model registry mm -hmm. for SageMaker pipelines. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and we'll see what how why this is so important. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and this is actually registered as a, as a model package, mm -hmm. which is a slightly richer entity yeah. than the model. It's the artifact, uh, the content types, uh, the instance types that are allowed to use for deployment uh, for uh, endpoints, and uh, the instance types that are used for that are allowed for batch transform. Okay, so you can start restricting, you know, allowing or you know restricting instance types. Uh, which is uh, kind of interesting for, you know, maybe cost management later on. Okay. Okay. So these are all my steps, right? And you can see this is really, really simple, especially if you've already uh, taken care of the processing steps. So now I can just define my pipeline, as you can see here. Okay. Pipeline mm -hmm. name, the list of parameters that I define uh, at the mm -hmm. beginning of the notebook. And and the steps, and they can be in any order. Here, I just happen to write them in the correct order, but you can put them in any order you want because the dependency will be taken care of mm -hmm. with the inputs and outputs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Pretty uh, pretty cool. And then we run the pipeline. Okay, so uh, we insert the pipeline in the list of pipelines ready to start, and then we just start it. And we can pass on parameters. Mm -hmm. So we had default values for most of them. So I use that. Uh, and uh, the two that I only, the two that I use here are obviously the input location of that uh, customer reviews data set in S3, the starting point of everything, mm -hmm. and the model name uh, to register in, um, in SageMaker. Okay. So we can start the pipeline. Okay. And then if we go to pipelines here, we're going to see, let me close this. Okay, we can see all the executions for, for this pipeline. Let me zoom out a bit. And you can see, you know, I'm not hiding anything, you know. Uh, people tell me, oh, it's some, you know, it's so easy for you because you know everything. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> took me a little bit of work to, uh, to do this uh, and that's fine, you know. That's fine. Uh, you know, some uh, uh, I, I went very gradually here, so you can see. All right, process and ingest that worked, uh, <laughs> and then I think I tried to add. Uh, what did I try here? Okay, and then ingest failed because I did something silly, so I didn't even get to build it. I said, but it's okay. It's iterative work, right? You you add the steps one by one, mm -hmm. make sure they work, and you build. Okay, and then it failed. It failed. It failed, and then probably I had some <laughs> coffee, and then it worked. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so we can see in uh, in studio, uh, we can see like this is uh, the full workflow. Uh, it lasted for one hour and 25 minutes. This is the full data set, mm -hmm. right? So it's 1.8 million reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a little, a little big, takes a time to, uh, takes a bit of time to process it and ingest it. And if I select, uh, if I select any of those steps, of course, I see information, so I see the outputs, right? Um, and I see logs, and this is probably my favorite part <laughs> because it means I don't have to go to CloudWatch. And the the absolute best thing here is the top, the most recent entry is at the top, right? and uh, <laughs> CloudWatch doesn't do that. So uh, yeah, please, CloudWatch, please. Uh, <laughs> I think we we need this. So here you can see all the logs and in in the the order that you would want, which is again most recent at the top, right? And we can see information on the job itself. Okay. So let let me go back to one thing that failed here, uh, just to uh, see that the logs are actually useful. Okay, there you go. So okay, build data set failed, syntax error. Probably an extra quote. Oh no, it's my okay, it's my uh, famous XXX thing saying I uh, forgot something, and uh, of course it breaks the the continuous uh, the line continuation character. So again, you can iterate quickly. You stay in Studio. You don't have to go to any other tool. It's all in there, and uh, if you have the right amount of coffee, like I did, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get things done right.
it's uh it's really i mean yeah i'm hiding nothing here this is really how i did it you know step by step okay um and so for example if we look at the training job again we see yeah we see you know validation accuracy you know it's exactly what we usually see in a notebook except i think here it's it's a little nicer right we have our job metrics it's pretty cool right it's pretty cool so we create the model at the end, okay? And so we see the model uh, as a model that can be deployed, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. And we register the model. And uh, this brings us to the model registry. So remember, here we set model approval status to pending manual, manual approval, approval, okay? Because we want an expert to look at the model before it gets deployed, okay? so. Let me show you quickly the model registry and then Sego will explain what this is. So model registry is here. Mm -hmm. And here we see, so for that um, uh, that uh, pipeline, okay, which is called uh, blazing text, blah, blah, blah. Um, we see the different versions, okay? Mm -hmm. So every time an execution like this, every time an execution actually completes, right? Mm -hmm it creates a new version of the model, right? So what is this and why is it cool? <laughs> <laughs> Good question again. Now, the model registry um, is super important because it's gonna let you track and catalog your model. In SageMaker Studio, you can easily view model history, list and compare version. Mm -hmm and uh, track metadata, such as model evaluation and metrics. Okay. You can also define which, may, which version uh, may, may or may not be deployed in production. Indeed, uh, after you create a model version, you typically want to evaluate its performance yes. before you deploy it in pro to, to a production endpoint. It's a good practice. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if it performs uh, to your requirements, so uh, you can update the uh, approval status of the model version to approved. Mm -hmm. If, uh, on the contrary, if uh, your model uh, does not uh, perform uh, to your requirements, so you uh, update the approval status to rejected. Okay. And uh, another thing which is important, when the status of the model version is set to approved, and uh, when it is done, then it's gonna trigger uh, a CI-CD deployment for the model. Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. this is really the difference between uh, training a model in SageMaker and, um, and building a pipeline mm -hmm. and, and a package like that, because, if you train a model in SageMaker, um, I would say the usual way, you know, you get to something like this, you know, you have all your models in the SageMaker console, and yeah, you can go and deploy any of those, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's nothing that prevents, a, let's say, a bad model from mm -hmm. from being deployed. The difference here is we have this, uh, we have this status, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's, we can click on a model, we can get, uh, we can get extra information. Um, so here I manually approved it. Mm -hmm. um, we can see actually the name of the user that did it. We can see the deployment history, right? Uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, we can see all the settings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that's pretty nice. And we can uh, compare models. You can do this, okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here that last uh, execution. Uh, worked okay and mm -hmm. so i have this model that says pending okay so i could inspect it you know i could say well i'm gonna grab that uh i'm gonna grab that model artifact in s3 i'm gonna deploy it in my sandbox i'm gonna run some testing and then i'm gonna say yes it's good or bad and and we can see what happens there okay so first let me uh, let me show you how we could actually deploy uh, those models in our in our sandbox. Okay, so let me go back to the notebook, and we'll talk about lineage uh, right after that. Uh, so here we just use the SDK for this, the SageMaker SDK, right? So we start from uh, the model package, mm -hmm. 
ARN. Uh, ARN is the Amazon resource name. It's the unique identifier for a resource inside of AWS. So uh, we, we just find this in the model registry. Okay, So I did not invent it. And this is actually, you know, that part is going to be the same because it's the, the model package group. And this is really the version, right? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so if you want to deploy version three, just say three here. And then I just import this using the model package object. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's super simple. And then I just call deploy as usual. Okay, so as this is a package, you know, I can't use any instance type, right? Mm -hmm. I have to use one of the instance types that were defined when I registered it. Remember here. Okay, so that's a good way to say, hey, no, uh, you know, you're not going to deploy this on uh, on you know, very big uh, GPU instances because you know, it's the waste of money and we don't want to do that, okay? And then I deploy it to an endpoint, right? Uh, and I predict with it, okay? Exactly like we've done two weeks ago, okay? So I can go and grab those model packages artifacts uh, and uh, and deploy them in my account and test them and, mm -hmm. and it's all uh, it's all fine, right? Okay, no no problem there. Um, another cool feature in the in the um, uh, registry is uh, what we call lineage. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, explain what that problem is, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one. No, uh, because uh, when you iterate and we can see that you've got like a lot version, a lot yeah. of version, a lot of parameters, a lot of different metrics, and so on. And if you do that every day, at the end, uh, after your uh, experimentation, you might have a lot of uh, train model uh, embedded into different steps and uh, tracking uh, all of them can be uh, very difficult, especially if you want to track manually, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a nightmare. And I think uh, this is uh, where the lineage uh, tracking uh, of uh, studio uh, comes to rescue because um, it's going to be very useful in order to trace uh, model lineage, improve, and after it will help you to uh, improve uh, your model governance and um, straighten your uh, compliance posture. Yeah, for so for example, here in the yeah. uh, in, in, on my screen we see um, the lineage information for the last execution, mm -hmm. right? And so we see specifically for each step which artifacts were produced mm -hmm. and which pieces, which inputs contributed to that. Okay, so for example. This is the uh, processing step, right? We can see here, process customer reviews. And it produces two artifacts and we have the full path in S3. So we know exactly which one this is. And so if we want to know, okay, this particular version of, uh, uh, of the uh, blazing text data that was produced, right? This one, well, it was produced by um, three inputs, right? This data set in S3, okay? And this processing script, okay? Which is in S3 as well. So this is not the vanilla version that I have in my notebook, right? This is the, the version that was uploaded to S3 by the SageMaker processing mm -hmm. job. So if you keep experimenting in your own notebook and, and if you change that, you have full traceability, this code will not be changed, right? Because mm -hmm. it was copied in S3 when the job ran, okay? So you can find all the input artifacts uh, and, and know exactly where this particular data set comes from. And we have the same for everything here, right? Uh, and we see, uh, you know, for the model, okay, that's a common problem. Mm -hmm. What data set was this model trained on? That's a very hard question mm -hmm. in many, and many times, well, here you can see this model was trained with this container and this data set, right? And no extra work. It's it's built in. Uh, it's built in your execution, mm -hmm. right? So this is, you know, it's one of those features that's going to save your life someday. Mm -hmm. You have a model in production. You're not sure which data set or which, I don't know, parameters it was trained on. Uh, well, just go to the execution that led to that model. And uh, and you have all the information. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's really cool. Super right? important. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so we deployed with the SageMaker SDK. Uh, we predicted life is good. Now, um, 
And we could say, uh, you know, um, we could say, well, that's good, right? Well, what, what, what else do we need? Right? <laughs> well, we need automation, right? We don't want to click in a notebook, right? We have fully automated our uh, our workflow here, mm -hmm. right? So why would we want to click in in a notebook at the end, right? Okay, so it's not not so good. Plus, uh, maybe it's okay to deploy the model in uh, um, in your account like that for testing, etc. But when it comes to production, right, uh, you need something more, you know, robust mm -mm. and more mm -mm. traceable and more ops looking <laughs> than <laughs> Jupyter and mm -hmm. uh, and notebooks, right? If you if you go and meet your friendly neighborhood the ops team and tell them, oh, uh, if you want to deploy, okay, here's a notebook, just click in the cells. Um, I'm not quite sure it's going to work, no. right? I'm not quite sure it's going to work. So we need another way to automate easily, completely, uh, without running code, mm -mm. right? Without running code. And so this is why a good way to do this is Amazon CloudFormation. Ah. Okay. Uh, so CloudFormation is one of the cornerstones of AWS. Mm -mm. Uh, we could talk about CloudFormation for hours, but really um, the best way is to describe it is infrastructure as code, right? So mm -hmm. writing templates in JSON or YAML that describe resources and creating them. And uh, why why is this the way we want to do it? So sometimes uh, cloud formation can be seen as your uh, best friend mm -hmm. um, because it gives you honestly a very easy way to model a collection of related AWS and third party resources to provision them quickly and uh, consistently and uh, an easy way to manage them throughout their uh, life cycles by treating, as you said, infrastructure as a code. A cloud formation template uh, describes your desired resources and their dependencies, so you can launch and uh, configure them together as a stack. Cloud yeah, formation so stack. <laughs> again, you know, I, I'm sure you know people watching this. Oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run the notebooks and I'm gonna write Python code to deploy. And yes, that's totally okay. You can absolutely do that. But when you start scaling things mm -mm. up a little bit, mm -mm. you know, when you have, you know, hundreds of models and, you know, oh, yeah. you never know, thousands of endpoints, uh, <laughs> it's impossible to do things manually. Okay, so you want to have deployment artifacts that just work every time and that you can version and, and you know, test and review, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so notebooks won't let you do that. Okay, so again, I encourage you to learn a little bit more or much more about CloudFormation. It's a super, super important service. Uh, you can deploy any kind of um, Amazon, AWS resources, mm -hmm. of course, you know, EC2 instances, S3 buckets, literally everything. So uh, time spent learning this is time well spent, trust me. Okay, <laughs> take my, take that to the bank. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, yeah, there's a nice YouTube video on the in the cloud formation console. So start there, right? Start mm -hmm. there. I love the service. Okay, so let's see what a template looks like. Okay, and like I said, you can use uh, JSON, which we're not going to use because <laughs> we're humans, and it's Friday, so we're going <laughs> to use YAML. Okay. Yeah. And. Don't worry, I'm, I'm, you know, if you don't understand all of it, it's it's reasonably simple here. Uh, of course, we have parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, model name, where's the model uh, artifact? And I should really stop saying artifact because I think English is actually artifact. So I'm sorry, I'll try and prove, or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. Um, we need the, to know the container that was uh, used to train the model because we need this to create the endpoint. We need an instance type, an instance count, and a role. Okay, so that's an important part of a lot of cloud formation stacks, mm -hmm. as they're called. Um, you know, parameters to make them as generic as possible. Okay? What you want to do is write a template that you can use for any model, mm -hmm. not just this one model. Okay. And then I'm going to create a couple of uh, few resources, and this is the resources section. So I need 
SageMaker model. Uh, and I need an endpoint configuration, which is really uh, a technical object with the uh, instance type, the instance count, okay? And the endpoint itself, which is basically that higher level object based on the configuration, okay? And the output of this stack will be the endpoint ID and the endpoint name. And these are actually created automatically, right, mm -hmm. for me, which is nice. So you don't have to give them names because if you're going to deploy this thing a hundred times, mm -mm. you don't want to call it model one, uh, endpoint one, <laughs> endpoint two, endpoint three, because somebody is probably using that already. <laughs> yes. So the cool thing about confirmation is it creates names, uh, right. unique names automatically, mm -hmm. so you will never have, you know, name collisions. Best right? friend, best friend. Yes, best friend. <laughs> so how do you how do you run this? Um, so two ways, actually. So one way would be to go to the CloudFormation console, click on Create Stack, template is ready, uh, and just pass either a local file or an S3 uh, object as the template. Click Next, fill in the parameters, mm -hmm. and just go. Right? And wait. Yeah. And wait for a few <laughs> minutes. Okay. So you can absolutely do that. I encourage you to try that out. Uh, but just for fun here, because we're automating and not clicking, <laughs> I'm actually creating the stack using um, Python code, okay? And uh, this could be actually a Lambda function again that we trigger or schedule, or it could be, uh, you know, it could be part of a deployment script in code deploy, or, you know, uh, you can actually deploy templates directly in, in code pipeline and code deploy. There are many, many ways to do this, uh, but here we're gonna run the code, right? So. Basically here, uh, I'm just grabbing uh, the information that I need, which is um, the um, name of the container that was used to train and the path of the model, right? And these are the parameters, right? Mm -hmm. The inputs to the stack. And I can easily find them in the model package that we registered in the model registry, okay? So just extract them from the answer uh, or copy paste from studio, but again, we're automating. So I really want to show you this thing with minimal human intervention. And we create the stack, right? Using a, using the CloudFormation template, which is here, right? So it's going to read that template and feed it to CloudFormation and then it runs, okay? Automation. And yeah, we see it. This one actually run. So let me show you here. Uh, the okay. cool thing is this, the events, so we can see everything that's happening in real time. And so we need to create a model up a resource, an endpoint config resource, an endpoint resource, and a you know, few minutes later, um, yeah, this took about seven minutes, we have a, a working endpoint, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and of course, I can, uh, I can see it. Uh, if I check here, I should see my endpoint. And it has a funky name because... <laughs> It was generated automatically, and I can go and predict with this. Okay. So again, you could either, you know, either you could write the template and give it your friendly ops engineer and say, "This is what I want to deploy," right? Um, and I'll pass you the parameters, and you can go and deploy it. Or uh, if they're really friendly, they can help you write this thing. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, and that's uh, that's a good way to do it. And you can run this one a hundred times. It will deploy a hundred times. It will mm. work. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it will just work every time. Uh, cloud formation is really rock solid. Mm -hmm. Now let's say we want to deploy a new version oh. of the model. Da, da, da. Okay. <laughs> so let's say we actually so we reviewed this new version. Mm -hmm. Right, and we tested it, and we're happy with it, and we say, "Oh, it's approved! <laughs> Good work. Great model! Go <laughs> for prod update." Okay, so this is going to move the model to approved. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we could actually check this, right? We could actually check this before we deploy and say, you know, are we really sure we're not deploying something that's, you know, that's been rejected? Um, and actually, if uh, so, we're not covering that today. But if you use the ML ops part mm -hmm. of of pipelines, um, 
which we might discuss in uh, in a future episode because it's really a topic in itself. Mm -hmm. How you move from switching this to approved to automatic deployment with code deploy and code pipeline. That's a one hour story in itself. <laughs> Um, but you could absolutely do that. You could absolutely trigger CI, CD uh, based on this status. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but let's say we want to, you know, we want to deploy with half formation um, and add that to our existing. Uh, let me close this. Yeah, add this to our existing endpoint. So I'm going to show you slides. Don't freak out <laughs> because they're cool slides, uh, right? So. When you deploy models, mm -hmm. you want to be careful, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you don't want to deploy a bad model that, you know, maybe for technical reasons or machine learning reasons, start predicting complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. So um, this is true for web apps. So this is true for microservices. It's true for everything. And everything. it's true for machine learning models. Okay. Especially. So there are two typical ways you could do this. So the first one is called uh, green-blue deployment. Mm -hmm. Uh, you may have heard of uh, red black deployment. Uh, I think that's the Netflix terminology. Mm, because of uh, same thing, right? Uh, so green, green, blue, red, black, same thing. Uh, so green, blue is pretty easy to understand. What we're going to do is we're going to duplicate our environments. Mm -hmm. So we have our existing endpoint, right? And uh, so let's say model version two, mm -hmm. right? and we want to try model version three. Okay, so we go and create a new environment. So that would be a new endpoint mm -hmm. with model version three. Mm -hmm. And we can test it, right? It's not live in production, it's kind of hidden. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. It's a, maybe it's a private DNS, maybe it's a, any any way. Generally, people use DNS to, to do that. Um, so you have your public version two model serving uh, traffic to your users, and you have private model, private endpoint version three that you just test. And once you're happy that it works, you switch all traffic to the new one, right? And again, this is usually done with uh, GNS. Um, so your, let's say your, uh, your business code could you know, automatically use an updated DNS entry that switches from V2 to V3, right? That's something like that. And so you can confirm that everything works. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason it doesn't work, despite your careful tests, <laughs> you can very quickly roll back, roll back yeah. to the blue environment, mm. right? Within seconds, you can say, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Not, <laughs> not going well, move back to blue, right? And you do the DNS thing again. As a... And you can investigate because you have the logs for the, mm -mm. you know, the green environment. But hopefully things go well. Mm -hmm. And once you're happy that things go well, you can delete the blue environment. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So that's that's a very popular way to deploy apps, okay? And you can see with uh, CloudFormation, this is super easy to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you would run that CloudFormation template again with your uh, new mm -hmm. model version. Mm -hmm. It will create everything in a few minutes. Uh, you take the uh, the output from that, uh, use that to uh, to test and switch your uh, your DNS, etc. And and then you can delete. Um, the blue stack, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And it's very easy to automate that. So that's one way, right? And again, the, the template that I showed you is enough to do this. You run mm -hmm. it twice, and then you do your, the D, or your ops team does the DNS tree, okay? Um, there's another way to mm -hmm. do this, which is called canary deployment. It's based on, you know, canary in a coal mine. Uh, you know, uh, in coal mines, you miners will have a canary <laughs> Uh, to test for you know toxic gas, and if they saw the canary die, then it was time to run. Right? Yeah, it's fun. It's not funny. <laughs> it's not fun. It's not funny. You know, mining in those days and still today is a very hard job. Um, so that's the, that's where the canary deployment comes from. So what we're going to do here is, as you can see, we deploy the we have our existing environment, right? And um, we're going to gradually introduce mm -hmm. a new model. Mm -hmm. So we could we could do this in two ways. Uh, we could do the two endpoint thing and have round robin DNS, mm -hmm. right? Or, and this is the one I'm going to show you, we could do this with one endpoint and model variants. 
Okay, but the the the, yeah. the theory is the same. Mm -mm. So you introduce a new endpoint, and maybe you send five percent of traffic to it, and you monitor things. And if it's fine, then you go from five to ten, and maybe ten to fifteen. You know, and you don't go, you know, zero, fifty, one hundred. It's not enough. You need to be more gradual than that. Mm. And, and you know, just gradually move and transparently move your users by sending increasingly more traffic mm -hmm. to the new version. Okay, and uh, eventually things are fine, and uh, and you know, you move everybody to the new green version, and you don't need the blue model anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is Canary deployment. So let me show you how we could do this um, using cloud formation. Okay, all right. See, slides can be good sometimes. Hopefully. All right. So remember here, okay? So here we, we're in that situation where we have uh, one model mm -hmm. and uh, and that endpoint, we can actually see it here. If we go to endpoints, we can see the, all the details here. Okay, there's only one variant, right? Which is my initial uh, initial model. So. Let's say now that I have a second, uh, oops, here it is, a second template, mm -hmm. which is really, I should say, it's a new version of the previous template. So it's the previous template plus yes. resources. Thank you. And, and we'll see why this is important. Because what we want to do is run this on the existing stack, mm. okay? So it's updating the stack. Mm. See, it's not a new one. No, it's, it's not a new stack. Okay. It's uh, it's Update. a new. It's an update with a newer version of the template. Okay. okay. So here we have the first model, and we have a weight. We'll get back to that, and we have a second model, and we have a weight, mm. and the rest is identical. And when it comes to resources, well, of, of course, we have all the resources for model one, mm -hmm. same as before. And we just add new resources with new names for uh, model two, okay? So we have actually, we have a model and we have uh, an endpoint configuration where we have two variants, okay? So it really means that model endpoint will be able to serve traffic coming from two different models mm -hmm based on weights, right, mm -hmm. for round robin. So now, um, if I run this again, and let's do it live because everything worked so far and uh, we have a few minutes, so let's just run this. It's time for something to break. Uh, updating the stack, okay? So first I create a change set. Mm -hmm. A change set will let me see what is going to change, and we can see it here. And this tells me I'm going to add a new model and I'm going to modify the endpoint. So you can say, yeah, this is really what I want, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not going to destroy everything. I, I, I have control, control change and I can understand exactly how these resources are impacted, okay? And I say, yeah, okay, fine. I'm happy with the change set, so execute it, mm -hmm. okay? and. As we do this, we see the stack yeah. being updated, okay? And if I reload the event, I see the update. And what's going to happen now is, of course, if we wait a few minutes, but trust me, it's going to happen. Uh, we should see our endpoint in the updating state. And after a few minutes, we're going to see two variants, okay? And then traffic will be sent to variant one or variant two based on the weights that I use. So here I'm keeping 95% of traffic uh, to variant one and five to variant two. And by running this again and again and again, you can change. You can see, you can say, okay, uh, every five minutes, I'm adding 5% to mm -hmm. the new one. Okay. And so by running those successive updates, you can very easily do uh, can I can I in a completely safe and controlled way mm -mm. Uh, because you have the change sets. Okay. It's really minimal risk. Like, uh, minimal risk mm. because you have the change set, you have the full history, and you can watch your, you know, business KPIs, whatever they are, and you can say, okay, this is just this is going to run to completion, mm -hmm. and um, and you know, all I have to do is keep an eye on it, or maybe I can have uh, automatic alarms 
-hmm. on uh, on whatever KPI I'm interested in and automatically roll back the stack if I wanted to. There, there's so much more you can do here. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, scratching the surface. Okay, uh, so I think that's pretty much yeah. what we wanted to tell you, right? It's almost time. It's almost time. Yeah. So, um, so as you can see, um, automation is not really complicated. Mm. Uh, the I would say if I wear my data science hat, it's pretty easy to build that uh, pipeline. Uh, uh, that pipeline using the the pipelines SDK, and uh, and I can still still deploy those models manually in my account, and then at some point, you know, I can talk to my ops team. Or, or, or I can do it myself, and I can use simple cloud formation templates to mm. deploy in a very safe and controlled way, a mm. repeatable way. Mm. Okay, here I deployed in the same account, but of course you could, uh, you know, you could copy our S3 artifacts to another account and then deploy in your production account. Mm -hmm. And this is a very simple way. It doesn't have to be. People are sometimes scared of cloud formation, but you can see this is pretty. This is basic, a basic example, but. Mm. It would work for prod, okay. Mm -hmm. And then, like we said, there's an a, a, a even more sophisticated way with full CI/CD using SageMaker pipelines, MLOps. But this is probably for another episode, okay? So, uh, screenshot time. <coughs> Final uh, slide with resources. Uh, all those notebooks that you saw are obviously available on GitLab, so you can go and, and grab them. You can run. Are uh, everything that I run today, uh, and of course, SageMaker docs and uh, a blog post on SageMaker pipelines that covers the the full service. Okay, so this was this was pretty complete. Yeah, <laughs> a big one, another big one. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you learned a lot. Um, that should keep you busy until the, the next episode. Uh, we're not quite sure what it will be about. We need to have a chat on that, but there, <laughs> there's so much more we want to discuss. Definitely. Uh, whether it's ops or distributed training, I'm oh. not quite sure, we'll see. Uh, thank you very much, Tego. Thank you so much. Thank again. you for your insights. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Thank you to all the colleagues that are helping us with uh, with this series. And uh, well, we'll see you in two weeks, right? And until then, keep rocking with machine learning. Bye-bye. <laughs>